I'd like to welcome you to the second day of our uh, 2017 OR meeting, and we are going to be we are going to start off today with a session on short but sweet project overviews from a variety of very exciting and different projects that are going on at ICPSR today. I think we are going to start off with our criminal justice archive and. Kate uh, Larder, Katie Larder, and Bianca Monzone and Matt Morley are going to come up and talk about it. So let me in, in, get them started. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Thank you for joining us, um, and welcome to our presentation for the National Archive of Criminal Justice Data, also known as NACJD. Uh, so I'm going to talk about methods of access. Um, Bianca is going to talk about some of our data. And Matt is going to talk about um, some of our instructional resources that we have available. So first, um, if you go to our website, you can search NatJD on Google, and it's usually the top result. Um, or you can go straight to the site if you have the URL, URL handy, which we have up here on the slide. In the upper right corner of the page, you'll see a search box. If um, <coughs> If you're looking for a particular study, you can oops, you can search it um, for it there. Um, I've entered um, the Pittsburgh Youth Study, LOBER, which is um, the uh, study we have, and the PI's last name. But you can enter a subject term if you're browsing the data, or you can enter the ICPSR study number if you're really familiar with the data. The more specific you are with the search, um, the more likely you're going to be able to find what you're looking for. Um, oh, technical. Sorry. Wherever you were at, sorry. Okay. So. Um, So uh, continuing on, so um, when I uh, entered the Pittsburgh Youth Study um, with Lober, I got a very specific example, um, or my result came up. It was the first uh, one I was looking for. Um, and then if I click on a link, the link next to, um, and next to it, the program of research on the causes and correlates of delinquency. Um, that I click on that, then I get the series page, which shows um, multiple data in the series. Um, okay. There are different types of access levels to the data that NICJD houses. Uh, the most common level is public, where anyone can download the data files. We have um, 1,752 studies. Uh, some studies have restricted access uh, because of confidentiality issues. Um, the restricted data and enclave data uh, have uh, an application process that you need to go, um, up, you need to apply for access. Uh, you must have an IRB approval or an exemption to be able to uh, access these studies. And it, to be able to uh, apply for access, um, once you go to the study page, so this is the Pittsburgh Youth Study page, 
Um, it'll say apply online for access to the, the, these data. And then you can um, go through the, it'll guide you through some steps and things that you need uh, for that. Uh, we also have resources available to help you. Um, we have our website uh, that you can search around. We have user support. Uh, we have a phone number that you can call in or an email that you can um, send an email to. And then we also have our Twitter account. So Bianca will now talk about our data. Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> so now that Katie's discussed different modes of uh, access to our data, I'm going to briefly highlight some of the data sets that we actually house with NACJD. So NACJD houses over 2,600 studies, and more than half of those studies are made publicly available. Um, so I'm just going to briefly highlight some of these. And to start, we have the Causes and Correlates Delinquency Series, which is a study that was displayed in Katie's previous slide. The Causes and Correlates study was a program that was initiated by the Office of Juvenile Delinquency Prevention. And the series is comprised of three longitudinal studies, thank you, one of which is the Pittsburgh Youth Study, which you see highlighted beneath. So all three studies use similar research divine, uh, designs. Interviews were conducted and administrative data was collected in an effort to learn more about some of the ju juvenile delinquency behavioral uh, problems. A resource guide is actually in development uh, for this series for users. And then with the current political climate, there's been growing interest in studies related to Latinos and immigration, as well as policing. So here I've highlighted a few studies that we have at NACJD related to Latinos and immigration. So for example, the second study listed explores potential correlates of labor trafficking in an effort to identify indicators of trafficking. And the study directly beneath that, the crime victimization and police treatment of undocumented migrant workers, is a study that um, explores potential correlates of labor trafficking in an effort to understand indicators of said trafficking. Uh, here we have a few data sets related to policing. Um, So the second study, the New York Police Department Stop, Question, and Frisk database uh, study was actually data that was collected during New York Police Department's Stop and Frisk policy program. And some of the data collected was reasons as to why the stop was initiated, whether that stop had led to an arrest, and demographic information on the individual who was stopped. And then the fourth study listed the police use of deadly force Although it's an older study, it's, it is very interesting because it's information that was collected through questionnaires about police homicides. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to talk about some of the uh, resource guides that NACJD offers for users. Thanks, Bianca. Yeah. Um, so I just want to give you a, a brief overview of some of the existing uh, instructional resources available at the National Archive of Criminal Justice Data. Uh, primarily, I want to focus on our new learning guides. Uh, the learning guides are uh, resources put together by the archive staff at NACJD with the intention of providing greater access and use of key publicly available studies. The first in this series was published in late summer of this year. That's the uh, 2015 National Crime Victimization Survey, NCVS. Uh, we expect another learning guide up on the archive website later this fall. Um, that would be the Law Enforcement Agency Identifiers Crosswalk, uh, also commonly known as LEAC. Just a word on uh, some of the features in the learning guides. Uh, they're intended for an introductory audience, ideally undergraduate students, but they're also a helpful teaching tool. Enough information is provided so that students should be able to work through the exercises on their own, uh, and they do not assume any prior advanced statistical knowledge. Uh, they contain helpful syntax files for replication within the data, as well as use overview summaries of the files, variables, and sample weights. However, uh, they do require that students have access to at least one of the three main statistical software packages, 
where we make this data available. So in the case of NCVS, that would be uh, SPSS, STATA, or R. So access to the learning guide. Right now, the learning guide is featured uh, beneath the fold on the NACJD homepage. Um, but you can also find it on our learning and data resource guide, uh, seen here at uh, level three on the slide. This is the uh, homepage for that, uh, for, the, for NCVS, uh, the learning guide. Um, so this is where students and teachers can access all the resources needed to perform exercises on the data where they, uh, and where they can learn more about things like study background or weighting information. Uh, from here, you can also access links to comprehensive study uh, reports provided by the Bureau of Justice Statistics. <clears throat> um, there are three main components in the learning guide. I'm not going to go over these in any detail, but I, I just want to point out that the second component up there on the slide is particularly helpful. Uh, it, it provides a high level of information about how to select files and explains key variable and weighting information, which can be really helpful information, especially to new users who are unfamiliar with the data. And uh, lastly, uh, I just want to go back to that learning and data guides page and highlight the resources guides at the bottom of it. Uh, these are really great uh, resources. Uh, Bianca mentioned them briefly in her presentation. They're intended more for the professional audience um, and people looking for comprehensive series and study level information about some of the most sought after data at NACJD. The, uh, the resource guides are all formatted differently with different goals and structures. I just wanted to highlight one uh, quickly, which is the uh, Uniform Crime Reporting Series Resource Guide, UCR. Uh, this guide is essentially a one-stop overview of 40 plus years worth of UCR data. So for instance, instead of having to sift through hundreds of different UCR study homepages and potentially thousands of individual data files, uh, the re this resource guide uh, is organized to give interested researchers a helpful overview of what the study contains, both in its wider scope as well as down to the variable level. In general, these are great places to point interested faculty and perhaps graduate students to, uh, who are looking for specific kinds of data but don't really have a good idea of where to begin. And with that, we'll conclude our pres presentation for the National Archive of Criminal Justice Data. Thanks for your time. Good morning, my name is Justin Noble and I'm going to talk about Data Lumos today, which is uh, one of the newer projects and repositories which was established at ICPSR in February of this year. So Data Lumos is a crowdsourced repository for valuable or at-risk government data. So a little bit of a background about ICPSR. Of course, we have a, a long commitment to safekeeping and disseminating of US government and other social science data, you know, a 50 plus year track record. And historically, ICPSR has acquired and processed government data collections either by the ICPSR membership or we partner with different foundations or agencies to make government data freely available to the public. So earlier th this year, uh, initiated by this staff concern and passion to steward at-risk government data resources, we decided to launch Data Lumos, the Data Lumos repository. So what Data, Lumo, Data Lumos is, is it's specifically designed to be a repository for government data in the social sciences that members of the ICPSR community feel that the data are at risk 
or there is some concern about its long-term availability or discoverability. So for uh, individuals who have a data collection that they think is potentially at risk, there are two ways to help. If they feel comfortable depositing those public data resources, they can do so directly on the Data Lumos website. And what that'll do is it'll house the data on the Data Lumos project site, and it'll also uh, catalog it on the main ICPSR website. Or alternatively, there's also a recommendation form that's on the Data Lumos site. So if there are data resources that individuals feel are at risk, but they don't feel comfortable depositing them, or they don't know where they are, but think that they are ri at risk because they may have already disappeared from a site that you had frequented before, you know, you can put that in the recommendation form. And then staff will do follow-up and investigate and try and add those resources on the recommender's behalf into the archive. So here's just a screenshot of the recommendation form. It is meant to be anonymous. We're just looking for basic information of the data set name, uh, the agency, and preferably the originating URL where that data resource was originally located. Uh, it also does uh, allow for optional information of your contact of your contact information so that we can collaborate with you uh, and get additional information if, if necessary. Um, and then in addition to the recommendation form, here's just a screenshot of our main website. And the overview of the deposit process is that because this is a crowdsourcing effort where multiple people can contribute data collections and they are immediately available on the Data Lumos website, we provided just a, some real basic outline and instructions. And so that these instructions include first doing a quick search on the Data Lumos website to ensure that someone has not already archived the data collection in Data Lumos or at ICPSR. Second, it involves uploading those at-risk data resources into the Data Lumos workspace and then describing the data by putting some basic uh, metadata, including the originating URL of where those data resources were housed. Uh, one thing that we also provide are steps to increase the findability of data or tips to, to do so. And so the, the minimal required fields are to add a title and a summary, um, but as well as a principal investigator or data producer information. Uh, as I mentioned, we also like to have you enter the original distribution URL to trace it back to a particular website and then complete as much additional metadata as possible to increase the discoverability and usability of the of the data. So, so far since launching in February, we have received a total of 44 data collections that were submitted as of the beginning of this month. We have also received um, 11 recommendations that came uh, from our online recommendation form. And then ICPSR staff and leadership have also been receiving recommendations on our own through outreach and our uh, networking with other government and scientific contacts and other colleagues at, at universities and throughout, you know, throughout the membership, including ORs. The, the neat thing about the Data Lumos project is that it's really picked up a lot of press. We've promoted it extensively on our social media channels. Uh, there were some campaigns that we participated in, including Love Your Data Week, uh, Endangered Data Week, uh, and then there's also been a handful of webinars that we've also participated in, including some with the Association of Research Libraries, an ICPSR webinar, and then we also uh, went to a Libraries Plus network meeting in which there were representatives from archives, research libraries, the open data community, government agencies, researchers, just a, a lot of players involved with data refuge efforts across the country. And so that was a place where we also were able to promote Data Lumos to a variety of audiences. And so because of all this promotion, it was really great that we were actually approached recently by the Annie E. Casey Foundation to continue our efforts uh, in, this, in this area. So they really liked what we were doing, and they heavily rely on government data resources to do their job and their policy work. And so they approached us about continuing to do outreach for the Data Lumos project and to add additional data resources that their constituents are using to do their work. And so we're going to do a lot of outreach to Annie E. Casey Foundation 
uh, awardees and grantees as well as others in the research community uh, over the next year in regards to data that is potentially at, at risk of becoming inaccessible or uh, not very discoverable. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Kay Mars. I'm a project manager here at ICPSR, and I'm going to tell you about the Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health Study. This is a relatively new collection within our holdings. The uh, Wave 1 data were released less than two years ago, um, so we're very excited to have these data, and I think during the presentation you'll, you'll understand why. Um, in 2009, the uh, Tobacco Control Act uh, authorized the federal, the Food and Drug Administration to um, regulate the um, manufacture, distribution, and uh, marketing of tobacco products to protect health, especially as some of the uh, tobacco products were um, uh, being, um, having health consequences uh, to people in the U.S. Uh, so then the PATH study was launched to monitor and uh, assess the um, tobacco use in the United States, its determinants, and uh, its impacts in order to inform the FDA's uh, regulatory activities. It also turns out just to be a great data set for researchers to use. Um, the PATH study is a nationally, a, uh, nationally representative Longitudinal Cohort Study. Again, it's funded by the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. It's administered by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is also the funding agency for our addiction and HIV archive here at ICPSR. Data collection began in 2013, and it's currently funded through 2024. They're hoping for it to be an ongoing um, surveillance uh, study. The um, FDA and NIDA had some scientific partners that helped with the design of the study, and they're listed here on, on, this, on the slide. Wanted to talk about the design features of the past study. Some are pretty standard for um, a survey, and some are really unique to the past study. Um, again, it's a longitudinal cohort design. It is nationally representative of uh, the U.S. population. They used a four-stage stratified population sample design. Um, the past study has almost 46,000 uh, respondents in the file, of which uh, over 13,000 are youth. Importantly, the sample includes never, current, and former tobacco users, um, so they can look at why people don't take on uh, using tobacco, why they do, and why they may have quit using tobacco. Uniquely, the past study surveyed, uh, sampled up to two adults per household. Uh, they did a heavy oversampling of adult tobacco users and young adults, and a moderate oversampling of African American adults. And they also sampled up to two youths per household. And over time, the youth in the file will age up, and they will be um, respond to the adult interview. Um, so because of that, they uh, have what they call a shadow sample that they planned right from the beginning when they were um, rostering the, the people for the study. And these are youth that were in the household that were ages 9 to 11. And then as over time, when they become 12, then they will enter the study. Um, and then every three years they will uh, refresh the shadow youth sample uh, so that that youth um, data set will stay robust in uh, the number of cases. Um, the ACASI was used for the adult and youth uh, interviews and biospecimens were collected from adults. 
just a bit more about this longitudinal study design. Um, it is an important feature, especially in the amount of information they are collecting on individuals. But they also planned for the past study to complement the cross-sectional surveillance uh, tobacco systems that were already in existence. So there is correspondence to some of the other um, data collections out there on tobacco. Um, just highlighting some of the bolded items in their uh, the longitudinal design. Um, it's really um, designed to look at product use over time, to look at initiation, cessation, and relapse in use, uh, to look at use and switching between tobacco products, the emergence of addiction and dependence, uh, looking at the correlations to uh, health conditions that are potentially related to tobacco use, the exposures to tobacco product use and their related biomarkers, as well as changes in people's views of um, the various tobacco products. It is um, looking at the evolving tobacco product market, and as time goes on and a new type of tobacco product comes on the market, they will be incorporating that also into um, the uh, survey. There are a variety of measures, not only on tobacco use and health, but also importantly for the FDA regulatory domains, but you know, really just a lot of mediators and moderators. And then they also, uh, the design allows the tracking of use changes wave to wave uh, for the overall sample and more, and also importantly to subgroups, which include uh, by age, gender, race, veteran status, those that identified as LBGTQ and pregnant women. So for example, did they smoke before they became pregnant, during pregnancy, or um, and after pregnancy? Again, they, they did um, ask about, I think, 12 total tobacco products. Um, some are the standard ones in, in the past surveys, but they also incorporated uh, e-cigarettes, hookah, dissolvable tobacco, and BDs and Cretex just for the use sample. Um, the, because of the ACASI, they were able to include generic pictures of the products on the screen and, um, and, so the, and description so they could make sure that when the um, respondent was answering questions about the product, the, the respondent was clear which product was being asked about. Uh, this was especially important for the cigar situation, uh, cigar products, because um, most uh, surveys put uh, cigars, cigarillos, and uh, filtered cigars all together into one question. They asked about those individually, so they needed to make sure that when they were um, asking those questions, they had the, the pictures that really corresponded to those specific cigar questions. And let me just back up. They, for each pot, uh, tobacco product, if they said that they used that product, then they answered questions on their first use, their regular use, um, uh, where they purchased the products. Um, and by asking about all of these products, they could then look about, at poly use of tobacco products and the switching of products um, in use over time. Um, like I mentioned, it's a, it's a pretty new data set, but we also have quite a number of publications that we know about based on the data. Um, so I wanted to highlight those. Um, the publications, the citations are available um, on the past study data series page, uh, which is really, and the URL is here, that's really the best gateway to find information about the past study because then we have links to all of the information we have on the past study. Just some of the publications, uh, as you might expect, uh, there's uh, a publication on tobacco use patterns among adult and youth, but then getting into some of the unique things that can be um, investigated with the past study, there's the receptivity of advertising by adolescents and their susceptibility to, pack to, to tobacco products. There's a uh, publication on the online tobacco marketing, which uh, a lot of the manufacturers have um, their own website and they offer online coupons. How much is that influencing people using their products? Um, publications about the beliefs about harm uh, from the different types of tobacco products. In particular, for those that 
uh, are listed as light or mild, are those seen as less harmful, and there's the new category of natural, organic, and addictive free, and are those seen as less harmful. We have a publication that looked at the rural versus urban use of traditional and emerging products, and also um, a publication on the co-occurrence of tobacco product use, substance use, and mental health problems. So quite a variety um, of topics. So I'm hoping that this uh, has piqued your interest in, in the past study data, and, and this is how you can learn what data we have available. Uh, right now, the wave one and wave two data are available, uh, both as uh, a restricted use file, uh, which is available to qualified researchers in the ICPSR VDE, and then we also have for both wave one and wave two um, uh, public use files that are downloadable. Um, we expect that the Wave 3 restricted use file will be available next year and the Wave 4 in 2019 and the public use uh, versions are released approximately 9 to 12 months after that Wave's rough release. And I mentioned that they uh, collected biospecimens on the um, on the adults only, and as of August, the biomedical data are now available, um, including the biomarker data. Um, right now, just wave one only. Um, there is um, 13. There are 13 data sets in the what they call the BRUF, uh, not including not only the collection information, so like the volume of the sample that was collected, but also the nicotine exposure questionnaire data, so they tried to get information from the um, respondents on their very recent tobacco use products that corresponded to the time that they took the sample, so that when uh, people are analyzing the biomarker data, they can also then look at the reported tobacco use from the respondent. And not only is there the collection weights, but there, is all, there are also eight panel assay data sets. Also, the BRUF is available only through the VDE, and the Wave 2 are tentatively planned for release in 2018. Also, as of August, they announced the availability of the actual biospecimens. Um, ICPSR will not be um, administering or handling requests for the biospecimens. That is going to be done through a biospecimen access program. and. Um, the link to the program is uh, available through the past study series page. And since um, I work for the Addiction and HIV Archive, I wanted to mention that we do have other tobacco use and substance use data available. Um, on this uh, slide is uh, the subject terms that relate to tobacco use and substance use and the count um, of studies that show on the website for these um, uh, these uh, subject terms, and so you can see we have hundreds of data sets that are on tobacco use and substance use. So um, I hope that this has um, got you very interested in using the past study data um, and uh, our other tobacco use and substance use data, and that you will encourage researchers at your institutions to apply and make use of our data. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Anna Ovchinikova, and I'm here to tell you about a completely new project here at ICBSR. We are working on archiving and making uh, new data available from the Gates Millennium Scholars, Scholars Project through a new contract uh, with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. A little bit uh, briefly uh, about the GMS program itself. It's a 1 billion 20 year uh, long commitment to provide uh, higher education opportunities to low income, high achieving minority students. 
In a given year, uh, 1,000 scholars uh, are selected to receive the scholarship. And since year 2000, uh, this program funded over 20,000 students. The program relies on non-cognitive and cognitive assessment measures in its selective uh, selection process. Uh, and students can apply for uh, funding uh, for their undergraduate studies, as well as uh, graduate studies, as long as they are in uh, uh, select uh, target disciplines, such as um, engineering, uh, mathematics, uh, education, uh, and so on. Uh, this, scholarships, uh, this scholarship is transferable. Students can transfer this scholarship to any uh, higher education college or uh, university in the country and can use it to pay for their tuition, fees, uh, books, uh, living expenses, uh, things like that. Um, this scholarship is what it's called a last dollar scholarship, meaning that it's designed to cover um, the unmet uh, need uh, that still remains after students receive all other federal scholarships and grants, such as the Pell Scholarship, for example, um, after all those scholarships are awarded. Um, In terms of uh, eligibility criteria, as I mentioned, students must belong to one of these uh, minority groups, and those are African American, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Asian Pacific American, or Hispanic American uh, minority groups. They must be citizens or per permanent residents of the United States. They must have uh, an accumulative GPA of 3.3 or higher. Uh, they must be accepted uh, at an accredited college or university as full-time degree-seeking freshmen. And they must demonstrate a significant financial uh, need as def defined uh, by the uh, Pell uh, uh, scholarship uh, criteria. And also demonstrate uh, a leadership commitment, uh, their leadership abilities. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the ICPSR uh, uh, data holdings, you may know that ICPSR worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the past to make available a number of data sets uh, containing information uh, from surveys of GMS scholars and uh, program finalists, those students who applied for the scholarship but didn't receive it at the end. So that data exists uh, in this following uh, cohorts uh, uh, from uh, years 2000, 2001 uh, through 2008, 2009. And as part of this new project, uh, we are working on enhancing usability of information uh, of, of these data sets by restructuring uh, the file structure uh, of this data. Uh, technically, each cohort has three surveys uh, in it. So there was a baseline survey and two follow-up surveys that's been done two years apart. So um, what we're doing now, we are uh, working on combining uh, baseline surveys with uh, uh, their follow-up surveys to produce one data file for each cohort. And we're also working on uh, creating uh, basically uniform situation with uh, uh, consistency with variable naming across cohorts and other data transformations uh, which will allow uh, researchers quickly see which studies and uh, which data sets and which uh, variables are available for uh, longitudinal analysis and analyze this uh, surveys across uh, uh, within and across multiple cohorts. And a completely new component of this project um, is the new administrative data. Uh, administrative records um, that we received from UNCF, United Negro College Fund. We received a lot of data uh, on uh, GMS um, scholars and finalists. And our curators are working uh, on making this data useful for researchers by assimilating this data into this uh, five topical areas. Uh, background information, student level academic data, financial aid, uh, career development, and institution level data. Um, I mentioned that we received uh, this data from UNCF, uh, uh, which is the main administrator of the GMS program, but it is not the direct source for some of the data that we received. Other sources include uh, National Student Clearinghouse, Higher Education Directory, uh, Federal Financial Aid, Institutional Student Information Records, uh, things like that. 
Um, so why we find this data so exciting? It is a rare opportunity for researchers to compare program uh, finalists, uh, students uh, that didn't receive the scholarship, with those uh, who did, and uh, study the effects of scholarship on uh, things like uh, student uh, achievement, uh, and so on. These are um, longitudinal data that can be analyzed by cohort, by year, and over time. And uh, more good, good news, more new data uh, we're expecting uh, over time, uh, another round of surveys uh, and updates for uh, administrative data through year 2029. And uh, ultimately, our goal is to link uh, the survey uh, data with administrative data, which is another interesting process. Um, and we, we hope will be really exciting for researchers as a resource. Uh, we'll be uh, trying to match uh, survey records with the administrative information uh, um, of uh, scholars and finalists um, based on uh, their demographic uh, characteristics, such as gender, um, age, uh, school, and major. So we are working on uh, re uh, releasing a new website for this project, uh, which researchers will be uh, able to use to access these new data sets. The website will also uh, provide resources and tools to help re uh, researchers to search, explore, analyze, and download this data. And uh, we are aiming to release a first set of administrative data at the end of this month. And this will include uh, um, institutional level data with uh, student characteristics and some financial aid data. Um, so uh, stay tuned uh, for news about the official uh, release date. Thank you. Hi, how's everyone doing today? Hi again. My name is Alison Stroud and I'm a product manager at ICPSR. And I will talk to you about the archive of data and disability to enable policy and research. So this is something that I do every time I present. I ask people to hold up any questions or comments that are not policy until the end of the presentation. However, I know I have a little bit of an accent because of my hearing disability, so I completely understand if you have some difficulty understanding me. So if you feel like this little guy in the picture with the help sign stuck in the bowl, not knowing what to do, just raise your hand and let me know if you need me to repeat anything, and I'm more than happy to do it. Don't feel shy. Thank you. So we have the agenda. I'll go over the few items today. I'll give you a brief background of the archive for those of you who do not know about this archive or how it got started. And I'll provide some updates of things that have occurred this past year, as well as some new exciting events and projects that we have coming up this next year or so. And also, I'll give a brief description of the conversations that we have had with researchers that we have connected with over the course of the last year. So here's a brief background. We started off the archive as an idea to add diversity to ICPSR collections. As you know, ICPSR has a lot of thematic collections with all different topics, and having a project that focuses on disability really makes ICPSR collections that much more diverse. And this idea was brought up at an all staff meeting back in 2014, and this idea was well received. And with the help of ICPSR staff and leadership, it became a reality. So I continue to thank everybody who works with me to make this happen to this day. And in late 2015, through the partnership between the Center for Lyme Data Research and Sharing and Rehabilitation and ICPSR, ADAP received funding support awarded to the CLTR in 2015, I believe it's summer or fall of 2015. And the part of the panel, so I wanted to show you a brief overview of what I'll go to do the CLTR. The CLTR is a consortium of investigators, of panelists, 
the University of Texas Medical Branch, and ITPSR, as well as the Employment and Accessibility Institute at Cornell University, and University of Michigan Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Department. So this is really a collaboration effort in order to keep the momentum for data sharing in the disability and rehabilitation research field. So since we launched our website in June 2016, we have archived 11 studies in Union Canada record. And we also have increased the accessibility for over 100 studies across ITPSR and made them discoverable through the ADEPT website. So this is really our I meant to be cross listy effort between all the other archives and ITPSR. So to make sure that we are also working together to make the data accessible, not just one archive website, but also multiple archives website. And we have the most popular study named the stroke recovery in underserved population from 2005 to 2006. So since it's been released, we've got 313 downloads from 26 institutions. And also, we just released a new data collection containing MRI images called the Atlas Study. And it's a restricted data collection that has also received quite a bit of attention over the last couple of months. And in addition to the study and projects that we have released, we also did a lot of outreach. And some of the outreach involved webinars earlier in fall 20. And we just did our first data creation workshop in June 2017. And this was also a very well received activity. And during this workshop, we worked with junior researchers and many other data users and people who are learning about how to start up this data collection and what the best steps and the most effective way to increase the impact of their research and disability and rehabilitation. And now I'll quickly go over the exciting projects that we have coming up. So currently we have the study called Sky We Have Undergoing Creation. And this means we are also working with the principal investigators in order to get complete data documentation. And for those of you who all know how we are about data documentation and making sure that we have every data that we need to archive the data and present it for secondary analysis. And after so much outreach, we also have studies, seven studies committed for the passion with ADAPT. And these studies, some of them cover a broad range of topics involving developmental and therapeutic therapy um, interventions for children with the developmental disabilities, as well as people in the elderly population with mobility issues in the Boston area. And finally, data that covers mandatory and wheelchair uses. We are doing a joint webinar with Cornell University on November 13th at 1 o'clock p.m. If you are interested in joining to look at the webinar, and this will talk about how Cornell University tools and adapt tools are connected with each other and how we can impact the increase of research and providing access to information about studies related to disability and rehabilitation. So be sure to chime in for that one. Now, we had quite a few conversations with researchers over the last year through email campaign and connections with other researchers. We have met with over 60 researchers through phone calls and a few time in person conversation, and that includes three participants from the lab, from this past summer's workshop, which is very exciting. And through these conversations, we talked about the importance of data preservation and making sure that we are providing opportunities for people to increase publication and citation in data sharing. And we, while we were having these conversations, we learned that many of these people do not actually work in what we will consider useful social science to primate or field. Many of them will work in fields related to rehabilitation medicine, occupational therapy, 
and adapt to technology and so forth. And we found that researchers were often very interested in data sharing and learning how to increase the impact of their research. But they were unaware of ICPSR or ADOP and how they can um, achieve those opportunities. So those are the things that we consider that we need to think about how we can find these researchers that we can connect with. In order to do that, we must extend the search beyond what we would consider the usual social science field and try to in increase our impression so that people are aware of HPSR and adopt in all of the wonderful tools that we have to offer with data sharing. So with that said, I encourage everybody to go for us and promote natural adapt. Because adapt is really awesome, but also all of the other topical archives that HPSR. I encourage you to look at your institution and the department or research projects that may already be there and just see what is related to disability and rehabilitation as well as criminal justice or substance abuse and HIV data. Take a look, connect with researchers, talk to them about IGPSR and what kind of opportunities that researchers have in order to increase the impact of their research and make their projects accessible to everybody. And I think that is all I have. And I say thank you for listening to me and thank you for joining for my presentation. I have my email out there in case you have any questions. And I'm also here at ITPSR if you want to talk to me about ADAPT and all of the wonderful data that we are planning to do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. I'm feeling inspired after that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh gosh, should I not do it right because I didn't listen to the directions? <laughs> Because it has to go through that. Mm. Okay. Sorry, I had parent teacher conferences this morning, and so um, everyone was prepared for me to miss the beginning, and apparently I missed the instructions. Um, I can start anyway. So, hi everyone. I'm Amy Pienta. I'm uh, director of acquisitions and director of um, some of these uh, projects at ICPSR. Um, I'm on deck to, and Justin should be doing this, um, to talk to you today about Open Data Flint, an exciting new project of ICPSR. Um, Um, so I'll start with um, uh, sort of the why behind uh, ICPSR became interested in capturing data about a single place. Um, obviously, in 2014, um, there were a series of events that uh, affected Flint dramatically in the future um, with regard to the water supply. Flint had historically gotten its water supply um, from the city of Detroit and uh, that water was treated well, and as it arrived to the city of Flint residents, um, it was a stable water source and not one that was necessarily problematic. But in 2014, uh, decisions were made to reroute the water supply um, from uh, the city of Detroit and use Flint water itself, so the, the Flint River water. Um, that water wasn't treated in the same way that the Detroit water was, or it needed more treatment. Um, and because of that and the aging infrastructure of the water pipes in Flint, uh, the water was corrosive and the lead in the pipes leaked into the water supply for, for city residents. Um, so that's not um, news probably to most people in this room. It was um, a major public health crisis, an environmental health um, news event, and uh, 
Oh, good, it looks cracked. Is that right? You in that little box? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I can talk better now that my slide is up. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, the water crisis um, was noted by several scientists and, uh, and change um, was uh, put into place. Um, because of this ongoing um, uh, crisis, public health crisis, uh, the water, even after um, change, uh, meant that the city residents would be exposed to lead in the water for a long time. So um, even today, even though the water levels have resumed um, healthy drinking levels, as reported, uh, the city residents are drinking bottled water. And of course, the entire uh, community in Flint and the state of Michigan and, uh, and the broader uh, United States responded with um, help and assistance to, uh, to Flint to provide um, adequate public drinking water. Um, and because of all this that was going on, um, there has been incredible numbers of investigations going on in Flint uh, to document um, the public health situation and, and hopefully the, the recovery of uh, the infrastructure and water supply. Um, the remaining things that are to be done in Flint are that the um, pipes are all being replaced and, uh, and that's I think when people will resume drinking, uh, drinking the public water supply instead of bottled water or filtered water. Um, so obviously being a neighbor of Flint um, at ICPSR we were really interested in figuring out ways that we could help um, in our way what was going on in Flint and so we um, generated ideas about trying to capture some of this ongoing research and data collection that was ongoing in Flint into our repository and so um, we knew that would be a lot of um, help and interest to the people in Flint but to also to other communities who have environmental health challenges um, as the response was documented. Um, we also were interested in being part of um, what might be seen as a positive future for the city of Flint, which has other um, socioeconomic challenges. Um, and so in general, it's always been um, a place that a lot of researchers at the University of Michigan are uh, actively working in, from the School of Public Health, for example. Um, and so uh, we've had some data over the years um, about the city of Flint, and we wanted to strengthen that that commitment. When we looked around um, the university at what others were doing, um, we connected with um, a newly funded initiative by the provost of the University of Michigan, um, also with funding from um, Michigan State University uh, and uh, U of M Flint. So it's a partnership between the three institutions to provide funding um, to help the research efforts. And so it was a perfect fit with what we were looking to do um, as well as a data repository trying to be of, little assist, of, of some assistance um, to the research efforts going on. Um, so the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center is coordinating research efforts in Flint and one of the things that they also wanted to do was find a permanent home um, for the data that were being collected. So um, we were a match made in heaven. Um, we uh, we joined together with the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center um, and created um, what we are calling uh, Open, Open Data Flint. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how this is sort of um, a regular ICPSR archive, and then I'll tell you why it's not a regular ICPSR archive. Um, so to begin with, of course, um, as you would expect, we are um, uh, identifying data sets that have been collected in the Flint region um, and bringing them in, curating them, archiving them, and releasing them. Um, these are, this is a word cloud of um, uh, the abstracts from the data sets that have been taken in. And this is really historic data sets, I guess I'd say. So these aren't necessarily at this moment about uh, the research collection of the water crisis because those are ongoing and are going to take some time to come to the archive. Um, but obviously the kinds of research uh, that we could identify that had been done in Flint um, focused on these many important topics. Um, we have uh, uh, the, the directors of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center 
who have um, also not just lent support to the idea of creating uh, a data repository for these data, uh, but also lent their data to the archive. And so they're uh, longtime uh, researchers who have um, spent many years um, uh, working in the city of Flint uh, on various research projects. And uh, that makes up a lot of the data sets. So for example, Rebecca Cunningham is an emergency room doctor here at the University of Michigan. Um, most of her data collections over uh, decades have been in the emergency room at Hurley Hospital. Uh, in Flint, Michigan. Uh, the study that you see here is um, baseline data um, that will eventually be longitudinal data of substance abuse using uh, teens and young adults in the area of Flint. They're identified through emergency rooms. So uh, when they arrive at the emergency room uh, for treatment, they also do screenings for substance abuse and it's a way of identifying then um, a really high risk population in need of services. Um, so that's her work and that's a bit about the data set that um, is there. More data related to that study will be coming. Um, we've actually at this point accumulated um, 20 studies into the archive in just the uh, roughly year that we have been um, in business. Um, we have um, not just studies and data collections that are available for public use but also restricted use. Um, some of those studies are also available elsewhere and we're simply pointing to them at this point. Um, but across all those studies we've accumulated over 7,000 variables that are searchable um, on, our, on our website. Things that you find in Open Data Flint of course are also available through ICPSR. Um, and related to those studies over 100 citations. Um, much like many of the projects of ICPSR, as I said, um, we're making that variable level um, information available and searchable so that people can see um, the kinds of data that are in the data sets before um, they might download them, for example. And this is important as I get to the second part of this project, why we're, why we're a little bit different. Um, we thought that we would be in a really good position to begin disseminating data from Flint because we're so interested in metadata at ICPSR. Um, we describe well the studies, uh, we describe well the variables, the question text, all those things go into um, how we release data. And one of the things that we were really interested in is providing data not just to researchers to do more research, but also providing data back to the community. So to take data from the community and put it in one place and not report it back didn't seem as exciting to us and it didn't seem as exciting to the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. Um, so we wanted to capitalize on our rich metadata um, and find ways to um, engage the community around the data sets. So to that end, we have um, over the past year begun to work with community partners in Flint um, on, on a couple of efforts. And this is a pilot project at this point. We have you know, funding for two years. Um, we are actively seeking additional funding from the state and uh, from the federal government to support this um, essentially research project going forward um, as we want to test these ideas. We're working with community partners to identify the kinds of topics and data sets that they actually want access to that would help them answer their questions. Um, so that is, that is the first part. Um, but then the other part is when we are able to locate those data sets for the community, um, finding ways to deliver them back. One of the things that we do at ICPSR is create infographics. And, um, and that is one of the things that we're doing with the Flint data sets that we take in. So easy, digestible uh, results from uh, these studies uh, put into infographic format that can be used in a variety of ways, either just viewed on our website or downloaded, included in presentations that our partners in Flint are making um, and whatnot. So that's one thing you'll find um, on our website. That's an example, a pretty example of, of one. Um, the other piece that we're just starting now in our second year is data literacy training. Um, we're interested in taking some of the, um, some of the training that we have done um, in the summer program and taking it directly to the community of Flint to engage community leaders there and um, community organizations um, who want access to or want more information about data and uh, data analysis and how to 
both use data for themselves but also consume data uh, to their efforts and ends that they have in Flint. Um, so that's the piece that we're doing now. Um, I, and, ooh, that's it. I got quickly to the end. Um, so, so one one note. Um, this project um, has been sort of a general project of ICPSR, which is has been um, uh, related to my involvement in the project. Uh, the Resource Center for Minority Data um, is the new home to this project. Um, Libby Hempel is the director. David Thomas, sitting there in the fourth row, is is the manager. Um, so both of them are transitioning to. Um, taking this project and carrying it forward with all of our help. Um, so I welcome you to contact um, either myself, you can find me on the website, or Libby with questions, or David as well. Um, but that's all I have for you today, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> I'm sorry, the people watching the stream didn't hear the question. Okay, sorry. Uh, what I asked was, um, in the beginning, uh, Amy indicated that this was a project that was being, um, you know, focusing on one community. And my question was, is this something that ICPSR is going to be expanding on, working with um, projects that, that are focused on other specific communities? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, of course we're interested because it's in our backyard and, and something that really um, inspired us and wanted us to help out. But at the same time, we've been certainly aware and monitoring um, open data movements that are happening in New York City and Chicago and Atlanta and Detroit. Um, so there are many of those efforts underway, which look a little different than how probably ICPSR would do it. So I actually think there is um, a lot of space for us to be involved in what is going on in these open data movements because typically what's happening is that there are government data sets that are being freed <laughs> in in these various communities um, which is which is fantastic but then I think there's still also that sort of research data component the kinds of things that we are collecting and curating uh, for Flint that wouldn't necessarily be available in those cities so yes to that end um, I'm interested in that. Libby is also interested in that independently. And so we hope that what we are doing in Flint is a model for um, other kinds of um, open data efforts that ICPSR can be part of. Um, we did try some of these ideas um, in other cities and proposals, um, and actually even in Africa. So, um, so it is something that we're very interested in, the data literacy component, um, opening up access to data, hearing from the community what data they want, all those things I think are um, valuable for the future of what, what we could do. Other questions? I had a question for Kay. <laughs> um, what are in the restricted files that aren't in the public use files for PATH? Okay. Um, we are developing um, a table, um, a file that we will be distributing that will make clear what are the differences in the variables. Um, basically, some of the um, uh, key demographics are more broad in the, in the public use file. So um, like um, the ages are in categories, the race I, I believe is uh, you know white, black, and Hispanic, and other. Um, but we could check that. Um, for like health conditions in the public uh, use file, it's separated just into those that are cancer related health conditions and all other, so you can't look at those specifically. 
uh, for the youth file, the information about the, the youth that identified as LGTBQ, I'm not sure, I'm sorry if I got, um, is only in the restricted use file. You cannot analyze that with a public use file, and it's condensed down only, I think, one variable in the, uh, in the adult file. So stay tuned. We are working on, on a list that will make that clear. Did I inspire other questions? Okay. Okay, well, that maybe we can thank all of the fellow panelists here one more time. Thank you for being a great audience. <laughs>